Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session of the Harvard Medical School Organizational Ethics Consortium. I'm Kelsey Berry, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the consortium, along with Drs. Charlotte Harrison and Jim Sabin. And today I have the honor to be your moderator, at least for the first half of the session, as we discuss how the world's largest professional psychiatric organization, the American Psychiatric Association, has engaged empirical data in its effort to uphold ethics in organized psychiatry. So first a note just about the series, the Organizational Ethics Consortium, which is now in its eighth year, uh, hosted by Harvard Medical School Center for Bioethics, provides an international forum for discussion of organization and health system ethics. Organizations can sometimes seem like monoliths, right? Navigating the world as powerful agents in their own right. And in that regard, we often ask in this consortium what it is right or good for a health organization to do, especially in moments of social, political, or health crisis. But organizations are made up of people, too, with their many individual choices and actions. And so we also want to know how organizations might cultivate ethical norms of behavior among their members and activate individuals as forces for good in the world. What tools do health organizations need to effectively uphold ethical norms at an individual level and keep their ear to the ground as new ethics needs might emerge in a constantly changing society? Especially, for example, when the organization's members are diffusely spread out in hospitals, offices, and private clinics across the nation. And so that brings us to today's program. The American Psychiatric Association counts as its members about 38,000 psychiatrists and is tasked with setting ethics norms for the practice of psychiatry. And today we have the rare opportunity to hear brand new data on the APA's ethics process and to more broadly consider the role of empiricism in keeping organizations on the ball. So we have with us the co-authors of some forthcoming work, uh, as well as two esteemed discussants to share their commentary on this topic before turning to audience questions later. Uh, so let's take a moment, therefore, to touch on audience participation. There are two main ways for you to participate today. First, you can submit questions for our speakers at any time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And then second, we also welcome you to use the chat box to share general comments and reflections or to seek technical assistance if you need it. So with that, I have the privilege of introducing our main speakers. Dr. Michelle Hume is zooming in uh, from Wisconsin, Wisconsin right now. Yep, <laughs> where she's a forensic psychiatrist at the Mendota Mental Health Institute, a state psychiatric hospital in Madison. Uh, while completing her residency, she was an APA leadership fellow and in that capacity worked with the APA Ethics Committee, uh, where she began work on the research that you'll hear today. And then prior to that, she was focused on pediatric ethics and policy at the Food and Drug Administration. And then we also have Dr. Phil Kindilis with us, who's a forensic psychiatrist and medical ethicist whose work focuses on professional ethics, global mental health, and empirical ethics. Um, and this is a little bit of a homecoming, we think, for Phil, who completed his residency at MGH and his ethics fellowship here at Harvard Medical School. Um, but nowadays, Phil is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at George Washington School, George Washington University School of Medicine um, and Health Sciences. And he's also director of medical affairs at St. Elizabeth's Hospital president of the Hellenic American Psychiatric Association and has been involved in APA ethics for a long time now, as far as I understand. Um, so we are very thrilled to have both Michelle and Phil with us today, and I will turn it over to Michelle to get us started. Thank you so much, um, Kelsey, for um, the really kind introduction. Um, I just want to share my screen here so that we can get started. All right. Okay. Um, so um, today I'm going to talk about um, some organizational um, ethics um, that Phil and I had the privilege of doing with the American Psychiatric Association. So um, for those of you not familiar with the organization, the American Psychiatric Association is the largest and most influential 
um, psychiatric psychiatric professional organization. And as Kelsey said, um, with about 38,000 members. And what's really important um, is our APA president and things like that at times testifies in front of Congress. It really is the public face of um, the organization. Um, and one of the roles of the organization is to promulgate specific codes of ethics and things like that um, that are um, used by its members. So there are a variety of ethics training opportunities available through the APA. The APA has a standing ethics committee um, and um, Dr. Lazarus, um, who was one of the commentators later was actually a former chair of uh, the APA's ethics committee. And so he will have a great perspective on that. Um, over the years, um, the ethics committee has um, promulgated principles of medical ethics and annotated the ones from the American Medical Association um, in ways that are specifically applicable to psychiatry. So again, um, you know, sort of lots of shared um, values, and I'll be talking about that a little bit more. In terms of actually handling ethics complaints against members, um, there's a variety of resources that the APA um, has, as well as the APA has an ethics office um, that is staffed um, and available for questions from, from any member at any time. Um, so in psychiatry, we spend a lot of time thinking about things like boundaries. Um, we often have very personal conversations with people in, in um, the course of therapy. And so maintaining appropriate boundaries um, is, is something that we really spend a lot of time talking about and thinking about. Um, and um, that's very important to us, as well as um, you know, the conduct of psychiatrists, confidentiality, obviously, often some of our patients don't even want anybody to know that they're even seeing a psychiatrist. Um, and then one of the things that uh, you may hear about later is something called the Goldwater Rule, um, which says that it's unethical for a psychiatrist to offer a professional opinion about a public figure. And this has come up numerous times um, over the years, but particularly in the last four years, it was something that came up um, quite a lot. Um, unless that psychiatrist, of course, has personally examined the person and so on and so forth. Um, again, we think a lot about outside relationships and conflicts um, with patients and a whole variety of things. So this is just a flavor of some of the principles of, of, of ethics that um, in psychiatry we consider important. Um, so if there is a psychiatrist that, that somebody feels has violated one of these principles, um, one way of handling that um, is to send a complaint to the American Psychiatric Association. And the association delegates the handling of complaints to um, district branches, which are sort of smaller, you know, often state organizations or regional organizations um, across North America. Um, and there are there are procedures, it's a peer review process, it's very well spell, spelled out for how to adjudicate um, those ethics complaints. Um, and so district branches um, have a standing ethics committee um, often to uh, do that. And there's a variety of outcomes um, if the complaint proceeds. One is more of an educational option for the psychiatrist saying, hey, you shouldn't do this, so on and so forth. Um, alternatively, the district branch can decide to sanction the psychiatrist if they so choose. So the APA has, has done uh, some prior surveys of ethics complaints over the years um, as a way of, of trying to use uh, empirical bioethics to try to understand our organization. Um, and so there is a couple of different prior surveys. One is, um, you know, from the 1950s to the 1980s, and then again from um, 2004 to 2007. Um, and so we'll talk about, I'll talk about in a little bit um, more about uh, that data. All right. 
So in the fall of 2019, at one of our ethics committee meetings, um, we had a very long discussion about, you know, gee, it's been 10 years or more since we've had empiric data on the handling of ethics complaints. And we wonder how the organization is handling ethics complaints now and so on and so forth. And so we just decided that we needed updated data, which was the impetus for the current survey. Um, and so Phil and I sort of sat down and constructed the survey and already here, um, we're talking about values, values of the organization in terms of the questions that we ask about for the survey. Um, and, and so immediately we're talking about ethics and values just simply by um, the types of questions that we ask. And you can see the sorts of things that we ask about um, on the slide. Um, this, the survey was approved um, by the APA's Institutional Review Board. So again, in the analysis, lots and lots of value-laden uh, stuff. And by the way, I mean, in, in some respects, this isn't hard, the tallying and so on and so forth, but you need a good statistician. So <laughs> make sure you have one of those. Um, but again here, in terms of how we tally the questions, coded the questions, Phil's gonna talk a lot more about this, but that's all about, you know, it's all about what we value and what we choose to listen to. And so, the, and so this question of values is sort of inescapable from um, good survey design. Um, so in terms of data, there were 95 uh, total complaints that our district branches reported over the last three years. Um, Many of these complaints didn't go forward either because um, there was no jurisdiction by the APA, the person wasn't an APA member, something like that. There was a simple lack of evidence or the complainant said something originally and then never followed up, okay? There were 22 out of the 95 complaints that actually underwent the peer review process. Um, and out of those, uh, there were two psychiatrists that were required to undergo educational interventions and one psychiatrist who was sanctioned. Um, so as you can see here, um, there's a wide variety in terms of the number of complaints reported by each district branch over the last three years. There are many that didn't have any um, and some that had quite a few. Um, in terms of the type of complaints, this is this in, in psychiatry, in terms of the kinds of things that we talk about is pretty standard and stuff that you can find in the literature. There's always, you know, practice issues. I didn't get the right medication, um, you know, something like that. Uh, boundary violations, we shouldn't have sex with our patients, things like that. Um, financial and billing concerns and report issues, all of these things are very typical. Um, if you look at the um, medical malpractice and specifically psychiatric malpractice literature. So um, in that sense, not too many su surprises. So what was very interesting to us though is, um, uh, is the overwhelming majority of our district branches rated the importance of conducting ethics reviews as important or very important. Um, and they cited a variety of reasons for that um, and things like the importance of community trust and patient prote protection. Um, and one theme that came up that I'll talk about a little bit more later um, is an obligation for psychiatrists to review other psychiatrists. So we ask about as well, what kind of ethics support to the district branches valued from the APA central office. And they talked about educational materials and procedural guidance and some things like that, um, that, that, um, that were interesting to us. We ask about challenges of um, the ethics review at the district branch level. Um, they often talked about procedural challenges, logistical challenges, and then again, things about um, what was within the scope of district branches to adjudicate. We also asked some questions about um, the relationship between district branches and um, and medical licensing authorities, because the other possibility if a patient has a complaint uh, about a physician is to complain to um, the state medical board about that physician. Um, and so we ask, we, we wanted to understand the relationship between our ethics process and 
um, you know, the more formal state licensing authorities. Um, so there were a variety of, of responses. Very often, um, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of crosstalk between our district branches um, and state licensing authorities. Um, at times, we had district branch refer district branches refer cases that were um, with, outside of the scope of of what they could review. Um, so in terms of additional um, results, this is more just out of interest. Um, the number of complaints was significantly correlated with the size of uh, the district branch. There wasn't any regional variations. Um, most district branches thought there wasn't a change or a decrease in the number of complaints over the last three years. And then we asked about the number of hours for resolving a complaint, um, things like that as well, which you see. So I mentioned this before, but one of the um, one of the themes that kept coming up is um, is that psychiatrists need to review other psychiatrists, and I think the reason for that is, um, you know, psychiatrists are trained in psychotherapy. We have all of this sensitivity to um, boundaries and these kind of dynamics that are just a little different um, than what other medical specialties have, um, and so. Um, and so that was really important to a lot of the, a, a lot of our respondents. Um, and again, thoughts that complaints need to be heard, even if they weren't serious, um, things like that, just a way for, um, uh, for the concern to be addressed. Um, when we compared our current data to the prior surveys um, that were conducted, the bottom line is the, the number of complaints um, seem to be declining over time, and we have fewer psychiatrists now um, that were found to have acted unethically uh, than in the past. And I think um, that, that's going to be an interesting topic of discussion later in terms of uh, why that may be true. So just a few final points. Um, you know, empirical bioethics is an inherently value-laden discipline. And if when you want to engage in it, you need to have real clarity about the organization's missions and values, like I said, even to, even, even to just design the survey um, and to analyze the survey, that needs to be clear. Um, organizational policy that is informed by data collection um, is a model for maintaining contact with evolving themes in the professional community, things that really matter to people. Um, and it also serves the transparency and the service missions of organizations like the APA um, to make, make it clear to everyone um, that we're trying to do what's best to hold our members accountable. Uh, finally, I just want to acknowledge um, my survey team, uh, as well as uh, the assistance of um, the council from the APA in doing this survey. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And we will turn it over to Phil to keep us going on the topic of empirical work in uh, organizational ethics. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Barry, um, and thank you to the consortium for uh, bringing us in for this uh, for this uh, meeting. Uh, Drs. Barry and Harrison, you've made this uh, an educational process, not just a little logistical one, and uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, it's a real pleasure too to have as discussants um, you know, two such uh, distinguished figures. I mean, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Lazarus uh, was like the third psychiatrist to. Uh, be head of the AMA, uh, and to really emphasize ethics, and I appreciate your emphasis on improving the healthcare system during your tenure, and uh, physician health, uh, the graying of the uh, uh, of the profession. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't follow the work of the Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs, uh, where Dr. Lazarus is the first AMA president to be uh, appointed there, um, this is some of the most thoughtful and well-written ethics in the profession. If you wanna look at the different controversies and the different issues that we have as a, as, uh, as a profession, go to the CJA website uh, and just read some of the stuff on end of life care and gifts and uh, how to deal with impaired physicians. 
uh, I mean, this is a, the touchstone for uh, so many of us uh, in the uh, in the profession. So uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Lazarus and Dr. Chen, an old friend who um, does work with uh, vulnerable populations that make her a, just a unique voice uh, in uh, in psychiatry. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, so my job essentially is to get into the nitty gritty and show you how this is done, and that there is a method. There is a favored method for doing empirical um, ethics for organizations, um, and that's the uh, that's the survey, right? So it's a, a mixed method uh, approach um, that does kind of quantitative stuff and qualitative stuff all at the same time. Uh, so you ask certain questions: how many complaints per year? Uh, do you, and then you ask opinion questions that uh, are open ended. Uh, where then you code uh, or categorize the answers, you uh, determine whether you're a lumper or a splitter, you make decisions on uh, what it is you're going to include or not. Uh, and as I say frequently, I mean, uh, the, the, the decision making on data uh, in research is, uh, you know, the black box of, uh, of, of empiricism. Because you, I, we make decisions all the time about what we're going to include, exclude, whether something's an outlier, whether it's uh, a representative uh, of, the, uh, of the sample, how you clean data, all the different uh, decisions um, come with the values that Dr. Hume has been uh, talking about. And uh, this issue of IRB approval, this is, a, this is a, a, an element of accountability to the community, right? It's part of the social contract. You're gonna transparently talk to peers who understand this work and say, look, I need some oversight uh, on this. What do you suggest? Can you approve it? Uh, because as Michelle said, the types of questions you use and, that, and how you analyze them uh, matters. So in academic surveys, you try to be as balanced as possible. Uh, and you, you don't do the kind of, uh, push polling that you see in uh, in politics right in politics you can write a question in a way that drives that determines the answer so you know your opponent is a satan worshiping you know infant eating you know blood sucking uh, uh, candidate who would you support him or our wonderful person uh, and again this is true conspiracy theory right you may have heard all this baby stuff uh, uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, and again, you can drive answers in this way. And you can drive it by choosing the, the, the order in which you write the questions and in which you put them in sequence. Because you don't want to get all yes answers and then it becomes automatic. You don't want to get all no answers. So there are lots of uh, principles of survey methodology uh, that again, make, uh, make values, uh, put values on the front, uh, on the front burner, uh, but also that allow you to generate uh, a certain quality of, uh, of data. Um, so, you know, what did we do? We had a short survey. It had to be short. Uh, the people we were talking to were, uh, were busy. Um, we used this quantitative, qualitative mix of open and closed-ended questions at the same time. We had a coding team of three people, um, uh, Michelle, myself, and uh, my chief uh, resident uh, here. Um, and we went through a kind of a training process. Uh, this is how you, inter uh, this is how you uh, code. This is how you categorize. This is how you interview. We had a bit larger interview team. Uh, so there's a little bit of training involved so that we could um, uh, uh, systematize uh, what was being done. Um, we ran a pilot with members of the uh, APA Ethics uh, Committee, developed a code book, which is how we're going to uh, categorize the different kinds of answers we're expecting and that we saw during the pilot. And we made this part of a, an iterative review, both in terms of the historical surveys that Dr. Hume was talking about. So an organization has to have some kind of a repeated process, some kind of a, an approach um, to look to observational and empirical uh, data, and 
the survey itself, the, the tool itself has to have a kind of an iterative process. So every five surveys, we would get together as the coding team and say, what are you seeing? How are you coding these responses? This is what I saw. I think I'm gonna have to switch this coding uh, category to a slightly different title and shove these answers back into that uh, code. And this is again, an, a way of making sure that something is systemic, uh, uh, systematic uh, and, uh, and repeatable. Okay, and then of course, you know, there has to be a process for settling disagreements, uh, and that's something that came to the uh, uh, co-PIs to uh, to me and to uh, Michelle Hume. So again, you see, there's a way of making this systematic, of making it comprehensive, um, but you have to have a, a, a you know a training uh, process uh, and one that's uh, repeatable, observable uh, at the same time. And then you've got to interview uh, people, right? How are you going to interview? There's going to be a script. Uh, there's going to be potential answers, uh, potential prompts that you have to develop and you have to agree on. So you're using similar prompts. Um, and then you, know, you develop this instruction guidance and uh, decide how you're going to contact non-responders. Um, I mean, we had a good uh, uh, response uh, from the district branches. But we also went after them three times if they didn't respond. So we, we made phone calls and emails. Uh, and then in the analysis, um, Michelle mentions having a good statistician. Um, I was a student at the NIH uh, many years ago, and the chief statistician had a talk every summer for all the interns and, and folks. And it was called, Why Didn't You Come to Me First? Um, so you're going to develop something or design something, but you need to have you know, the right sample size, the power to uh, answer the question that you need to answer. So there has to be a previous literature that you can analyze and say, look, with a sample of 100 people, I'm likely to get a distinction between, you know, geographic areas, uh, let's say. So the statistician can help with that. And uh, usually they're part of some kind of an academic core in a medical center, um, or you can contract with someone as we do uh, with the medical schools uh, for a few thousand dollars uh, a year uh, to get some statistical hours. But statisticians are critical uh, to design uh, and analysis. Um, so here, let me just give you some examples. Uh, I don't have a, a lot of these for you, but the way in which we coded some of the open-ended responses, a lot of them were what we called practice issues. And these were complaints that, uh, suggest that complained about someone not uh, treating them without a, an office visit. The uh, psychiatrist said, oh, you have to come in for me to prescribe something. They didn't like that, so they filed a, a complaint. Um, they didn't like the diagnosis uh, was one of the complaints that was given to them. They were told that they had a personality disorder and that was insulting. Um, so all these different kinds of things we thought we could lump into uh, something, a code that we call practice issues. Um, and there were jurisdictional uh, answers uh, identifying the, the complaints that they had. You know, do we have uh, a jurisdiction over non-members? We do not. Um, there was a complaint from an inmate uh, about uh, how they were treated in the correctional setting, uh, which was very interesting and uh, inspired a discussion on, uh, on scope as well. And then lots of financial uh, issues. Um, and here, the, the idea of scope uh, and jurisdiction, how are they different? Um, and this is something that we look to the uh, APA principles for. Um, and then distinguishing things like procedure from logistics, uh, which are two closely allied uh, ideas, but we have a process. We have a, a published APA process for complaints. And again, because we know the field, we know how the APA works, we can shoehorn these answers into a procedure code, these answers into a logistics code. Uh, and that's the other thing, when you're categorizing or coding things, the values that you bring from the organization matter because you're a part of it. And the way you know what the important questions are to ask and how to analyze them is because you've been part of the system. Okay, so if you come in cold, you have to talk to people. Uh, but if you've been with the organization for uh, many years, it's a lot easier to know what the resources are and how to make uh, these category decisions. Um, 
there's also this Likert kind of uh, approach to these surveys. How important do you think uh, things are? And then you know, with the statistician, you can decide if something can be lumped into very positive answers like four and five or very negative answers like one and two. Uh, there are ways of cutting the data uh, where you show how important something is uh, and that you can make the sample large enough to generate something uh, significant. And that's what we do here uh, with high Likert, Likert scores, uh, answers being um, you know, the, the importance of uh, ethics review because of professionalism standards, uh, trust of uh, the community, the need of psychiatrists. Uh, and Dr. Hugh mentioned the Goldwater rule. There was only one mention of the Goldwater rule in complaints, uh, but I can assure you that there are plenty of uh, direct questions and challenges to the APA Ethics Committee on this issue, especially after the last uh, four years. Although, you know, there have been psychiatrists who write books like uh, Bush on the couch, Trump on the couch, these kinds of things um, that violate the, uh, uh, the Goldwater uh, rule. And I'm glad to talk about that um, uh, professional standard um, in, uh, in these times. Um, oh, I have a, here a picture of, uh, um, of the St. Elizabeth's, um, uh, the bluff over the city where uh, we were built uh, 155 years ago. Uh, this is one of the original photos. Um, and again, uh, an element of public sector where, uh, you know, the environment, the, uh, uh, the geography lead to holistic uh, 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 treatment. Uh, and, and recovery. Um, finally, and I already see questions in the chat about why there's so few complaints and uh, uh, are we more ethical than other uh, uh, professions? Uh, we're just better people. Uh, and again, our, our sense is that everything's going to the licensing boards now um, rather than to us. Uh, and we've turned more to an educational option uh, in enforcement so that we're not seen as the ethics police. Uh, this is something that Dr. Hume uh, likes to talk to us about because uh, it's very important that we're seen as collaborative uh, before we become um, uh, you know, prescriptive. Um, so um, we can talk about that in the uh, discussion. Um, but a lot of discussion, a lot of answers and questions, uh, responses to our open-ended uh, questions telling us exactly what's going on out there that the boards are getting uh, more of this. And they do tend to be more conservative, I should say, don't have a lot of psychiatrists on them. Uh, so these boundary issues that we run into um, are not always understood or they're understood more harshly uh, than, than we do. Um, and we did ask questions about when people are referred uh, to an ethics committee rather than uh, a, a licensing board rather than the ethics uh, committee. And again, you see the kind of values and the answers. When something is egregious, it's like, well, what is that? Uh, what complaint is egregious? Um, and a lot of legal stuff and this distinction between law and ethics uh, is a classic one. Um, there's a lot of ethics in the law, a lot of law uh, in ethics. Um, and you see that that's where a lot of the ethics committees that uh, the chairs that we talk to um, where they were making these kinds of legal judgments. This is more a legal question. This is more an ethical question. Uh, and for those of you who've been in this business for a long time, uh, you know how hard it is to draw these distinctions. Um, so that, that's it for me. I mean, I, I, I just wanted to make the case that there is a method. Uh, it is systematic. It is imbued with values. Um, and it's the first step in an organization's uh, kind of development of their organizational ethics. So you have to have something descriptive before you have something normative, right? So you have to know what's out there, know what the issues are for your uh, community. And then you can say, well, we probably shouldn't be doing X. And these are the standards that we should be following uh, instead. Uh, so that's, uh, that's it. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. Well, thank you so much, um, Michelle and Phil, uh, really letting us kind of peek behind the curtain, I think, of APA ethics and, and what goes into such a robust process. Um, and in part, also really showing us how ethics and empirical work are so deeply interrelated. And 
a culture and practice of empirical inquiry can certainly be ethically productive for an organization and revealing areas of need and areas where attention is warranted, but it's also ethically demanding, right? Given the many value-based choices that are going into the design and interpretation of this kind of empirical work. Um, so for, for those of us uh, who are really being trying to be thoughtful about the um, potential for you know, ethics in our organizations and in the world, there's just a lot to think about in the course of engaging empirical inquiry, um, not only how it serves our aims, but how ethics can serve the aims um, of developing good empirical work. So um, we are very fortunate to have two discussants who I know you've been um, hoping to hear from. So both of them have thought deeply about ethics in organized medicine, um, and then also how well-conceived empirical work can bring ethically relevant insights to the fore. Uh, so I'll introduce both, and then we'll turn to Donna first for her commentary. But Donna Chen, Dr. Donna Chen, is joining us from Virginia right now, I believe, um, where she's an associate professor at the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics and in the Department of Psychiatric Medicine and Public Health Sciences at the University of Virginia. And there she does quite a bit. So in addition to her clinical work in psychiatry and research focus on the health needs of underserved communities, uh, she also oversees the ethics and professionalism component of medical education and does organizational ethics for her uh, institution. And Donna was previously at the National Institutes of Health, where she trained in consultation liaison psychiatry and in research ethics. So we'll hear from Donna in a moment, but I will also introduce Dr. Jerry Lazarus, uh, who's coming to us from Florida today. Uh, Jerry is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the University of Colorado Denver School of Medicine. And he first became involved with ethics at the APA right after its birth uh, in the early 70s um, and was chair of the APA Ethics Committee quite early on before heading over to the American Medical Association, uh, where he was first delegate and then speaker and then ultimately president of the AMA. Uh, and he's now serving his fourth year on the AMA's esteemed Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs, as you heard from Phil. Uh, and some other activities of Jerry's currently on the Ethics Committee of the Department of Defense and working with the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at University of Colorado to integrate the lessons of the Holocaust into medical training. Um, so we're Pretty excited to have both of these commentators, and I'd like to bring uh, Donna in first. Go ahead, Donna. Thank you, Kelsey. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, thank you for inviting me to um, commentate uh, for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, I have tried to limit my, my discussion to five minutes um, because that's what I was um, hoping to do so that we can get conversation going. So I have, I don't know, three, maybe four um, observations I wanted to make. The first is I think many of us think about organizational ethics as kind of what an organization does. Um, what a prof and the APA as a professional organization definitely has ways that it manages its kind of ethical processes, but it's also an organization of professionals. And so what the APA does affects the, the, its members in their own offices, in their own potentially private offices. Um, and that's some of what you heard about today in this um, really wonderful talk. Um, but as some of the folks in the Q&A have noticed, right, this, this particular way of tracking how our profession is doing and how the organization is doing, um, focuses really on a very downstream um, way of counting and looking at problems. When you look at complaints, right, there, that's obviously really important um, to learn about um, when we figure out what we're, how we're actually doing um, as an organization and how we are helping our members um, stay um, doing the right thing. Um, but there are so many factors that go into whether a complaint is made, how it's tracked, how we find out about it, that it, it is a, it's one small lens into how the profession and professional ethics um, are going. Um, another thing that the uh, American Psychiatric Association does, um, which was touched on a tiny bit, not in depth, was that it has a huge 
kind of educational component. Um, and that's another aspect of kind of what, what I would, what I tend to see as the organizational ethics of the APA. Um, the APA has an office and a committee, an ethics committee that helps answer questions. They do what in many organizations we would see as um, ethics consultation. So any member can call in and get a consultation from the APA. Um, and many of those end up generating educational materials. They end up um, in opinions that um, are, get tracked over time that are associated with our ethics code. And those are updated every year and available to everybody. And so it would be really interesting to actually um, study that, study those, the questions that come in there as another lens to what are the kinds of ethical issues that our, our members are facing and what it's a more proactive approach, it's a more preventive approach. Um, but that's another view on what kinds of things are within that area, I think, of ethics in what psychiatrists are doing and what they're facing. Um, the, so kind of an, another, I guess, piece to this um, that thinking about this talk uh, really got me thinking about was, you know, when we, when we create these educational materials, we in some ways have um, an ideal vision of how they will be used and how our members, whether, how our members will follow the, the kinds of guidelines um, that, that the materials um, support them in, in, in doing. Um, and so I think there's an interesting process to think about from an organizational perspective as to how these educational materials that might present a, a, an ideal vision of how people should behave, when do those become enforceable as ethical norms of the profession in a way that not doing that would generate a complaint? So one area that I was thinking about when I was thinking about this is that the APA, um, as many, many organizations has really, really taken to heart um, how we might address um, structural racism within our profession um, and you know, addressing some of the historical um, uh, ways that we contributed uh, um, as a profession and potentially as an organization. And so there are, are a lot of really, really useful educational documents and statements that the APA has made in this arena um, around structural racism, around implicit bias, even around explicit bias and outright discrimination, um, really putting these conversations on the table. Um, and so, however, like many organizations, the efforts around um, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion actually exist slightly separately from the ethics processes of those organizations. Some, sometimes they overlap, but in many organizations are actually separate, there's, there's, there's separate processes. And so it got me thinking, and this, this I hope we will have time for discussion about, um, you know, at what point would the kinds of educational materials, the kinds of um, uh, you know, visions around how we all ought to um, behave, at what point would those, would the ethics processes of the APA step in to monitor those, um, to potentially um, oversee them? Um, and at what point would they entertain a complaint in this area as a, a complaint about the ethics of one of its professionals? Um, so I think that's it for me. Hopefully I didn't talk too long. Not at all. We really appreciate um, your drawing our attention, Donna, to kind of the challenges of measuring ideals of conduct um, and, and looking to ways to identify how to hold accountable to ideals of conduct that are perhaps um, only uh, recently being really highlighted as essential. So uh, really appreciate your bringing up this topic. And we'll hear from, um, Dr. Jerry Lazarus now, we'll have time to come back to this big question that you've asked Donna. So, uh, but first we'll turn it to Jerry. Jerry, take us away. Thank you, uh, Kelsey. And, and thanks to uh, Phil for those very kind words that you mentioned about me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. 
Um, in a sense, this goes back to the beginnings of my involvement with ethics because I was on one of the first district branch ethics committee back in 1973 when the APA annotations were first published. And uh, then as Kelsey mentioned, went on to become chair of the uh, APA ethics committee. I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, also Dr. Rebecca Brendel is currently on AMA's uh, CJA and uh, Dr. Jim Sabin was also on CJA uh, a couple of years back. Uh, what I wanted to comment on was um, a, bit, a bit more about what the AMA does, which in, in many ways is similar, but uh, in, in, in many ways also different. I think one of the things looking back, uh, when we started in 1973, we didn't have the kind of data that Phil and Michelle are giving us today. And I think that's extremely helpful to be able to track the kind of complaints that are coming in. And I think it's also fair to say that the APA was really uh, at the forefront in pointing out uh, uh, sexual misconduct, boundary violations, as, as Michelle mentioned. Uh, even though this had been part of the Hippocratic Oath, uh, I think we found that uh, there, were not, uh, there were not enough aggressive and assertive actions against psychiatrists at that point who were involved in, in boundary violations. So I think the APA was really at the forefront in that. But uh, trying to contrast what goes on at the AMA, um, as you all probably know, or if you don't know, uh, the AMA was founded on the bedrock of uh, code of ethics, as well as standardized educational uh, programs. And it's uh, enshrined in this really big book, Code of Medical, it's really thick, but it's, uh, that's what CJ was, uh, that's what uh, Phil was referring to. So the, the Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs at the AMA has, has two main functions, similar to what the APA Ethics Committee does. Uh, first, and, and really foremost, is to work on ethics policies for the association. And the way this is vetted is the uh, committee comes up with a report, which it delivers to the AMA House of Delegates, which in one form or another represents every physician in this country. Uh, because it's represented by all state specialty, state and specialty societies. And then recommendations are made and either accepted or not accepted or referred back. And then eventually when approved by the House of Delegates, these go into an opinion uh, that is published in that big book that I showed you. So that is, that is really the uh, North Star of ethics policy, which drives a lot of the rest of the policy of the AMA. So for example, if you looked at the recent controversies about vaccines, vaccine mandates, masks, uh, confidentiality issues, uh, these are all addressed uh, in these opinions. And uh, these are all uh, available online for free if anyone wants to take a look at them. So it really addresses issues that are, are current and also emerging. So then the other part of what CJA does is it does uh, adjudicate uh, complaints that have been brought through state medical licensing boards. And as opposed to getting these uh, complaints from patients or others directly, the approach that uh, AMACG uses is to only adjudicate, since the time I've been on, that's the only ones that they do, that have been adjudicated through a state medical licensing board. And then the, we have a similar process where we have hearings for that, that uh, physician, and then a determination is made about a sanction of one kind or another. Uh, so that's, it's, it's quite different in, in some ways from the a APAs, and we can talk a little bit more about why the number of cases at the a APA has fallen off, and I might have some thoughts about that in addition. But um, I think it's also fair to say that the complaints that we look at, and, and Phil mentioned this, you know, how serious are they or how egregious? I think on a continuum, they are probably the more severe uh, instances of complaints that are brought against physicians, not always. Uh, and because the primary obligation of the state medical board is to protect the public, uh, sometimes the uh, actions that they take against physicians may be actually more severe than we might take in more of a uh, peer review process with our own colleagues. But the state medical boards also do um, uh, if, if necessary, they will require a physician to have ethics training or boundary violation training or medical records training, all kinds of different courses that they're required to take 
to try to help in their rehabilitation and, and return to practice uh, and, and finishing up with their ethics complaint. Um, I did want to comment a little bit more about the uh, data that Phil and Michelle brought forward, because again, I, and I think this reflects a little bit of what Donna was talking about. I, I think this um, is, is really important data, but I think it's really the tip of the iceberg because it really is uh, only based on the complaints that are brought to the district branch and the other mechanisms that we use both at the APA and at the AMA to gather information about what current uh, ethics issues are relevant to physicians and for psychiatrists in particular, uh, those are brought through the, uh, the APA board and the APA assembly and through its district branches. But I don't think we are uh, tracking those as much as we probably should. And as I was thinking about the empirical ethics part of this, uh, I think we should be thinking about both at the APA and uh, perhaps uh, Becca and I can bring this back to the AMA as well. Uh, although we at the AMA track the kinds of uh, the number of complaints we've had that we've adjudicated and the, sanction, and the sanctions, we haven't actually uh, indicated what they're for. In other words, what the uh, complaint was about. So I think the fact that that was gathered through the district branches, I think is extremely important. Of course, at the AMA level, the complaints are public knowledge. So one could go back and look at what they're about, but uh, I don't think we have that information. So we have the one piece, which is the adjudicated ethics complaints, but we also have additional information about what's coming forth from the members about what uh, current ethical issues are. And I don't think we're capturing that in this data. So I think we're, we're, we may be picking up uh, pieces of issues that may be of ethical relevance, but we, we may not be always picking up the issues that are of uh, relevance right now in a broad fashion, which don't result in complaints. So I think the, um, the approach similar to the APA, where I think it has really moved from more of a uh, disciplinary process when uh, I was involved uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s to more of an educational process is something similar to what we've tried, we are trying to do at the AMA and have been trying to do because there are tremendous uh, resources regarding uh, education and ethics. We've got the uh, Journal of Ethics uh, and we try to provide guidance to physicians uh, of any specialty by uh, allowing them to take a look at the ethics code, uh, we get hundreds of calls uh, from physicians and others about the code, you know, what to do when you have an ethical dilemma. So much of this, again, is hopefully before a physician has sort of crossed the line and either done something mildly, severely, or egregiously unethical. And I think that's what we are aiming to do, to try to educate the profession, to try to keep them out of these ethical dilemmas. I'll just make one more comment before I, I finish, and that, that is um, the AMA, as well as the APA ethics, for the most part, uh, has been written for, with the individual physician or individual psychiatrist in mind. But really, more recently, we are also paying attention to how that individual physician should also, within their organization, try to influence the values and the ethics of that organization. And I think that has been a, a change over the last number of years uh, to make recognizing that uh, physicians often uh, are working in organized systems of care, they're employed, they're in, uh, in different uh, offices where there's integrated care and not just in their own private practices. So uh, we wanna make sure that whatever, whatever ethics guidance we give will be transmitted to the organizations in which those physicians uh, are working. So uh, I think I'll uh, stop there, Kelsey, and uh, look forward to the, the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Lazarus and Dr. Chen for bringing us these additional perspectives and essentially extending the issues that were brought forward by Drs. Hume and Candelis into related contexts. So even adding to the sort of scope of the work that's been brought forward for us to discuss today. At this point, we're beginning the open discussion period of the consortium session. This period has two components. One is discussion among the speakers, 
and the other is discussion with the audience. So first I wanna give a quick reminder and invitation to audience members. Please feel free to contribute your thoughts to the chat. And if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A where it's easier for us to track and be sure we have seen it. I think also to our four speakers, um, we are about to start this discussion by inviting you to pose questions to each other. Um, we thought we would ask uh, Dr. Chen to kick this off because she had posed questions in her uh, commentary and perhaps would like to select a couple to lead off with and uh, then just invite other panelists to, to jump in. Dr. Chen. Um, actually, I wondered if if the um, folks in the audience knew what the Goldwater rule was. I know I didn't bring that up in my, um, in, in my um, comments, but uh, I guess that's one thing that, cause it's come up several times. And so I, I wondered if, and Phil had said that he could comment on that. Um, so I think that was one thing. And the other is I really do, I would love to hear the people who, you know, run the ethics committees for these big organizations, how some of these ideals end up becoming enforced by the organizations as, as kind of ethical, ethical norms and rules. Great. So can I take a crack at that? Because uh, I, I, I think that um, the questions that Dr. Chen and Dr. Lazarus raised can't be answered empirically um, and then we can make policy from that. So if we do a survey of the members, right, we could have something like the Structural Racism Task Force tried to do. What are the problems out there? If we survey the APA Ethics Office to see what the phone calls are that come in, uh, right? or if we look at the assembly to see what kinds of proposals are being now, all of this is imperfect. And the structural racism uh, surveys, for example, again, they had to do these things. They had to look to the membership to see what their understanding was of structural racism. Uh, but when you get only 500 to 700 responses out of a potential 18,000, uh, because that's what the uh, access was, that's not effective data, right? So you get a 0.04 response rate, percent response rate. Uh, we had uh, Michelle on ours, um, 65%. Um, it's very hard to make a judgment, right? So the data matters, the quality of the data, how it's gathered and how it's analyzed. And we run into these problems, but we still have to do it, right? We still have to survey members. We still have to take the next step. For Dr. Lazarus' question on, you know, how we how we look at all the potential routes for ethics uh, complaints. Um, you have to choose a regression stopper at some point, right? So for us, it was to repeat, to continue the iterative process that the organization had taken in the past. So we look at the prior surveys and we say, ah, we can improve on this by doing a well-constructed questionnaire and doing something similar. And we stop there. So the next survey could be of members or of complaints at the same time, but the quality has to be good. You can't have a response rate of 0.04%. Um, and you have to, I mean, even the responses for the structural racism task force out of APA, there was still a percentage of people who responded, well, I don't see it, there is none. I don't know what you're talking about, don't know. Um, and again, that's not helpful. I mean, uh, we know that there are people who don't uh, see it, but it's not helpful to, it's a waste of our resources uh, to get answers like that because we're interested in, in moving forward. Um, so two uh, responses there to kind of bring in uh, Drs. Lazarus and Chen at the same time. Um, and on Goldwater, uh, again, Barry Goldwater was the conservative uh, uh, the, the Republican um, uh, candidate for president in 1948, when was it, 64? Um, and uh, psychiatrists uh, did a survey, uh, one of the, uh, a, a failed magazine uh, did a survey of several thousand psychiatrists 
who said he was unfit, that he was schizophrenic, that he was, uh, you know, a danger to humanity because he was conservative and would use the A bomb. Um, and uh, obviously, the outcry was uh, was impressive. And uh, the APA wrote a particular section of its principles uh, about, you know, making comments about people in the public uh, in the public domain. We shouldn't be doing it. We value informed consent. We value confidentiality. So unless you've got permission from, and again, Rosalind Carter, Tipper Gore, I mean, important people have talked about their mental health uh, issues. Unless you have permission, unless um, uh, you've uh, uh, examined someone, you should not be making statements about public figures. Uh, it's a it's a violation of all these kinds of principles of informed consent and confidentiality and and good science. Frankly, uh, it's uh, uh, there was a book I think uh, recently about twenty seven psychiatrists have an opinion about the president, and uh, everyone had different diagnoses and different approaches. So it, it's not a particularly useful uh, uh, statement. Um, so I'll 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 stop. That's very helpful. Thank you. My turn. Do others want to speak? Michelle, did you want to? My, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, Jerry. Go ahead. I don't know if it's my turn to ask a question or uh, I did have a comment. Um, Michelle, yeah, did you want to? I was going to ask if Michelle wanted to say anything yeah. further about the questions that, uh, that were brought forward by Donna. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to defer to Jerry, um, because I am interested in, in what he has to say about this. Jerry? Okay, I'm not sure what the this is, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to respond to what Donna brought up, because I think, I think the important issue here is um, how the organization sort of looks at ethics. And uh, I would say that at the AMA level, and, you know, again, not being on the board of the APA, I suspect it's very similar. The, the organization often looks through an ethics lens at many of the questions that come up before us. Not always, maybe not as much as we would always like, but oftentimes uh, it does. So for example, during this last year, during the pandemic, there was a whole section of the AMA uh, website that was devoted to ethical issues related to the pandemic. You know, about masks, about vaccines, about those kinds of issues. And so, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of physicians, a lot of uh, organizations were looking for guidance on how to deal with this issue. So it was, it was right there. So, that, so, and I think when Donna brought up the issue of disparities, I think, again, the uh, council, the ethics policy also looks at that, but I think the ethics lens is something that I think the AMA pays special attention to. There's also one additional part on the organizational side is that recently the organization has uh, convened a committee that looks at complaints about uh, behavior amongst its own members within the governing bodies or its committees. So for example, through, with the House of Delegates where you've got you know, maybe a thousand people uh, or the committees uh, and uh, is, is tasked with adjudicating complaints against those individuals. So it, it, it was formed mainly around issues of harassment of various kinds, sexual harassment and so on. So that's the way organizationally uh, the AMA has dealt with it. And, and Michelle might have some other comments about APA, but I did, I, if I have a chance, I would just want to ask my question uh, to Michelle also that, and Phil, because you know, it does seem, uh, as I see the data that you have, that from the time that I was involved with the APA, that the ethics committee has moved considerably away from being more of a disciplinary or ethics police or functioning in that manner. And I, I know there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, and it, it's striking to me that of all the complaints that there were only two educational interventions and one, one sanction. So, um, and I, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm wondering if it's really, it really is functioning as a peer review process. And the fact that the district branches are telling you that the psychiatrists think that they have an obligation to talk with their colleagues when there's a problem, I think that's absolutely correct. 
but it, it sounds like it's more of a peer review process um, than uh, sort of uh, the ethics process that I remember. So that, that's really my question for Michelle and Phil. So just to clarify, your question is, you know, is, is this, is, is it a peer review process versus, versus what? Versus, I'm, I'm not quite sure well, I'm on understanding. That, I, well, an ethics procedure where you, you have a process that you go through, whether you either have a sanction or you don't. Uh, oh, a, peer, a peer review process where you're basically discussing with colleagues, you know, it, it sounds like there's been an ethical a, a, a complaint here, a problem. What do you think about it and how can we, how can we help you deal with that? So the, I mean, the, the, the peer review process, the procedures that the APA has for handling the peer review process, handling um, the, the, the process is actually, it's actually fairly involved and it involves, you know, getting um, more information from the complainant, sometimes, you know, records potentially, um, all of that kind of um, all of that kind of thing, and then it's from that um, that review that is done typically by the district branch ethics committee. Um, that then there's a decision made about you know what what is the right outcome here, and does the you know first of all did the psychiatrist violate the ethical principles in some way, um, and and if they did, then you know sort of. Uh, what do we do about it? Um, so it is, I mean, the, the procedures are actually very well spelled out by um, the APA for the peer review process, and it is quite involved. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a peer review. I mean, I, Jerry, you know, we used to have something called a grievance uh, process, uh, where it was much more collegial, and uh, it was for things that didn't quite rise to the level of uh, a complaint, and that was very peer review and education uh, oriented. But with the shift in the last five, 10 years to this kind of educational uh, component, uh, those things, I mean, they still happen, the peer review counseling, the peer counseling happens, but there's also education for the patient. So if the patient says, you know, the doc won't write me a disability letter, I'm filing an ethics complaint, there's education that goes on in, in that direction too. Um, so, you know, this is allowed, you need someone independent or what, or what have you. Um, so there is uh, that, that peer um, flavor throughout the, the, the process. And I, I think that's what's valued uh, by, the, by the membership. Because um, the other aspect of this chair is whether it's etiquette or whether it's ethics. And a lot of these complaints seem to be etiquette. Uh, issues um, and the kind of education of how you talk to a patient or what a patient should expect um, it goes on throughout the process. So it may not get to the end. Um, again, the other stuff where you're defrauding me by billing too much and things like that. I mean, that, that goes everywhere. That'll go to the board uh, of licensure. It'll go to uh, the district branch. Uh, people file lawsuits, you know, civil lawsuits to recoup uh, the fees that they uh, paid to psychiatrists. You know, I didn't understand a cancellation policy. Your fees are too high for the introductory. I mean, it's not all, uh, uh, you know, massive issues that you and I discuss at, uh, you know, when we craft these answers. Um, there, there's a question also about cultural issues. And, you know, I hope that attendees understand that the cultural formulation is now a part of our profession. I mean, it's part of the DSM. Uh, it's part of our the, the appendix, how to do a, a culturally informed interview. Um, so when we have uh, patients from global representing Global South, we are we are applying um, you know principles of exploitation, principles of insensitivity, principles of uh, you know violating. Um, the rules of confidentiality um, in through the cultural lens. It's not just the ethics lens that Dr. Lazarus is talking about. It's this cultural lens uh, as well, about how people should talk to each other, how they should behave, uh, whether the space between them is uh, is culturally appropriate, uh, whether the kind of eye contact that, the ma that they make is considered uh, uh, you know, part of the problem. Uh, you know, are they being paranoid? Are they being disrespectful? 
Um, so the, the cultural formulation is very much a part of, uh, uh, of psychiatric evaluation and of the ethics uh, uh, process. I just wanted to say one, one more thing, Phil, and then uh, it looks like there's some other questions, but uh, as you probably, you mentioned the difference between etiquette and something else. And uh, I think uh, there were a lot of concerns about many of the earlier editions of the AMA code that had more to do with etiquette issues rather than the ethical issues. So, I mean, the reframing of the code and uh, it is really more around the, you know, the significant ethical dilemmas uh, that, uh, and opinions around those that need to be addressed by physicians, not, not the etiquette kinds of things. Yeah, so taking very seriously the increasing challenges and, um... It sounds like there, in some ways, this begins to address some of the question about evolution within the organizations that Donna was bringing up. And, uh, you know, there was her, the component of her question about how things, uh, you know, how ideals end up getting into a position of being enforced within a, within a professional organization. And we could say the same for other uh, organizations in healthcare. We have aspirations, we declare, we make statements of our goals and our values. And then, you know, how do those statements begin to translate into more sort of enforceable and targeted uh, uh, aspects of uh, running an organization? And uh, what's the contribution of empirical work to to those to that process, I wonder if people would want to comment. I think you have illustrated one way. Uh, is there anything more that people would want to say about that? Do you envision uh, other ways? Well, um, you know, if you look at the AMA code and the opinions, we have shoulds or shalls or mays. So uh, I don't think that, you know, we, we, the AMA, the CJA itself doesn't act as the sort of ethics police going after everyone that violates any of those opinions. I mean, the hope is that physicians will look to the AMA or psychiatrists look to the APA and the AMA to determine whether something they have done or they're considering doing or something they have seen rises to an ethical problem. And we get, and I, I know the APA gets these calls also. We get hundreds of calls, as I mentioned, questions about, you know, is this, is this an ethical thing to do? And, um, you know, we, we can go over that with them. We can direct them to the opinion. You know, at the end of the day, the physician is going to make a decision about what they're going to do. And hopefully it's the right decision that benefits a patient and doesn't hurt them. I mean, but, uh, you know, we can't, we can't go after each ethical decision. I mean, we, we try to set the bar high uh, and set it high at doing things that are for the benefit of the patient primarily, as well as for the benefit of society and, and ourselves. But uh, you, you, the balance is usually towards the benefit of the patient. Mm -hmm. And that's how we do that sort of ethical analysis. And I, I know the APA does the same thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I mean, I think that's the answer to uh, Dr. Chen's question. I mean, I, it's... There are, there are standards for exploitation and for maintaining the best interests of the patient. And we fit a lot of these complaints into that, uh, that framework. In fact, we went back to the uh, educational commentary that we uh, did. We've renewed that every so often. And we added some of the um, uh, racial uh, language to it so that it's very clear that we're talking about uh, racist attitudes and uh, racist behaviors. It's a, a kind of a move towards anti-racism. Uh, Can I comment real briefly on this wonderful, brilliant question on restorative justice? Um, there's a question from Rebecca C. Would you describe the APA review process as comparable to restorative practice in academic integrity, such as you know, a college or university would consider? I don't think we're quite there. I, I don't think we're there to facilitate the, 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 the disagreement between the patient and the psychiatrist, because it, there's so many protections of confidentiality 
uh, in this in the process. So the, I mean, you'll guess who the patient is if you're if they're filing a specific complaint. But those things are kept separate uh, for so long that it's not quite restorative justice. It's not quite the facilitation between the complainant. And it's more educational in two directions that don't often uh, meet because of the protections. I mean, you can't identify people, you can't even identify the psychiatrist when it comes to the district branch. We say, we have a complaint. If this sounds like anyone you know, first of all, get off, recuse yourself, uh, and then we can discuss it in uh, vague uh, terms. And then we, there's an investigation that specifically talks to the psychiatrist and the, uh, and the patient complainant, but they're kept separate. So it's not quite uh, restorative practice where, you know, people kind of figure out their own thing with a facilitator, uh, but a brilliant question. I mean, I, I'd love it, but there are just too many uh, liabilities, both uh, institutional and legal. Uh, there are some protections that uh, the psychiatrist uh, requires. Really helpful. And I think you just uh, started to dip into the audience questions, which we'd like to do next. Uh, Kelsey, let's see what you're what you're seeing in the chat and the questions. And also, if you want to add a moderator question, please feel free. Um, so there's there's quite a bit um, looking for more context right around the declining number of ethics complaints over the years. And I'm sure that some of what you've said have uh, has already spoken to that um, in some respects. But I just wanted to um, raise that and give you a chance to, to muse a little bit or, or if there is uh, an appreciation of perhaps what is causing um, a declining number of complaints, um, the audience would love to hear that. And, and I'll just add a, a second piece to that, which is to say, how might a declining number of complaints be interpreted? Um, from the point of view of the organization as it considers the role of these empirical data as a potential guide for uh, future work on ethics in the organization. So I, I will I will try to tackle some of um, some of that question. We had um, a, a, you know lots of our members when we ask them um, you know, about whether they perceived that the number of complaints were declining and all of that kind of thing. One of the questions we asked was why, you know, why do you think that's true? Um, and, and people had all kinds of um, ideas about that. And some of it was um, a little, um, maybe a little bit self-congratulatory, um, I, I would say, in terms of sort of saying, well, we're better trained now, you know, we have all this ethics curriculum that is part of medical school, which is certainly true, um, um, you know, all of that kind of thing. I think one of the other things that is, that's very clear from um, our survey data too, is that there's the perception that a lot of the, a, a lot of the really, you know, more egregious complaints are going to state licensing boards because um, there, there is the perception um, that, you know, the state licensing boards have a little, have, have teeth in terms of, you know, actually being able to take somebody's license away or something like that if they actually did something that, that rose to that level. Um, there was, you know, there was one of the other questions I think in, in the chat is, um, you know, do, do, does the public know about this avenue of, uh, being able to, to complain? Um, and, and in some cases, yes. And in some cases, I think no. Um, and, and so, um, you know, making a complaint is not hard. You call up the organization and sort of start there, but, um, but, but, you know, does the public think to do that or does the public think, you know, gee, I don't, I don't like what my doctor did. They did something, you know, egregious and unethical. I, I'm going to go to the state licensing board, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I think that, I, I think that there's um, a couple of, I mean, I think there's multiple reasons um, why it is that overall the number of complaints is, um, you know, relatively low given the membership. I think to weigh in just a little bit on this uh, as well, sort of thinking back of the history, um, because uh, early on, um, when we first started out in this process in 1973, the state medical licensing boards really were not, especially sexual misconduct, were not taking it particularly seriously and uh, would often not do much about it. 
Uh, and I don't recall um, you know, how that message got out to the public, but then uh, we had an upsurge in cases. Uh, I don't think we had any more <laughs> cases at that time than we had in previous times, or we still have these cases, but um, there was then an avenue for a patient to complain and get you know, some investigation and, and some action against the psychiatrist. And uh, what happened after that uh, was I mean, the, these complaints, when you had the ethics complaint, became very serious for the psychiatrist's ability to practice. So, for example, when the National Practitioner Data Bank came into existence, these, these uh, actions were reported to the National Practitioner Data Bank. We made the, uh, an expulsion or suspension from the APA public. We put in a notice in the newspaper so it could affect their privileges at a hospital or getting insurance. So, so the stakes were very, very, very high. So um, that's why, and it, but, but since that time, the state medical boards have taken these kinds of complaints very seriously. And, uh, you know, the, the psychiatrist or physician has, you know, uh, a legal process to go through, attorney representation at the state medical, state medical board. So the protections for them are, you know, much more reasonable than at the point that we were doing those in the early days. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that that is the primary reason, but it's probably one of the reasons why there's been somewhat of a decline. I, I'm sure there are many other reasons in addition. Michelle and Phil might agree or disagree. <laughs> I don't know. No, I mean, I, they see a lot, the board see a lot more complaints than we do, than the district branches do, that's for sure. Um, and there are, lot, there are civil lawsuits too. Um, sure. So I, I don't, yeah, I don't think that people know as much to go through the district branches. There aren't complaint forms in uh, outpatient offices, uh, right. as someone has suggested. Um, but, you know, they do ask, say, hey, you know, I, this is not right. Who, I need to complain. And docs tell people how to do it. It's like, look, if you have a complaint, you talk to the board, you call the district branch, here's the number. Because um, that, that happens too. I mean, we see that with these cases. There's also a question about what happens if there's insufficient data. You know, can people be wrongly, uh, you know, convicted or referred for disciplinary action? Um, and generally not. I mean, if there isn't data, if there, it's not confirmed, if it's uh, a rambling psychotic letter or something like that, then uh, the psychiatrist is not uh, thought to be, um, you know, uh, eligible for you know the educational option or something more serious. Um, so I think these investigations also help. Um, so you send a couple psychiatrists, you talk to people, you, you look at the record that's available, uh, and you make the best judgment uh, possible. So I think that just on really kind of on this theme of considering perhaps the public's behavior as a determinant of the complaints that might be um, coming to uh, the district branches, as well as, of course, the kind of shifting areas of responsibility and enforcement of, of different institutions. But I just um, wanted to develop some of the questions that I'm, I'm seeing coming up um, in the audience Q&A. Uh, so this work is really kind of demonstrating a commitment to a bottom-up approach and kind of this deep listening to those who have complaints, communities, um, in a way that could potentially help identify blind spots, right, that the organization might not otherwise really be thinking about from the point of view of ethics education. And what I wanted to ask is, how, how do data like these, which have the potential to guide that practice and thought, um, if they do rely in some respects on communities' awareness of their role in raising their voices, um, what challenges might this raise uh, in consideration of the fact that there might be kind of a squeaky wheel effect um, that could dampen what you learn from communities that are not as accustomed to raising their voices um, in the context of perhaps problematic encounters um, or who have not been listened to perhaps in the past um, and therefore or are not quite as likely to complain in the ways that are described if there's a barrier or a lack of information about how to do so. Um, does it maybe suggest a role for the organization in considering more education of the patient population to be able to help spot um, concerns or how, how would an empirical approach kind of address some of the concerns about the underlying um, bias in the data itself?
boy, I think we could write a dissertation on that. Um, you know, that would very, I mean, I, yeah, the data has to be good. It has to be descriptive. It has to be real. Um, yeah, and this, this was our issue with COVID. You know, I, we got a lot of questions, the uh, APA Ethics Committee on, you know, the obligations of institutions. So institutions weren't prepared, generally speaking, for the pandemic. We're, we're prepared at a certain level, right, for emergencies. We have a certain amount of protective, personal protective equipment. We have a certain number of uh, in, uh, you know, respirators, what am I thinking of, uh, intubators, intubator. Uh, um, so we're not quite prepared. What is the organization's responsibility? Uh, and certainly seeing the phone calls come in to the uh, ethics office, it was a lot about that. Why am I being put in close proximity with the patients now? There should be social distancing. They should be masked. Uh, shouldn't we be doing more telemedicine? So we came up with some guidances, uh, Dr. Lazarus uh, pointed out. We had online forums. Uh, Dr. Brendel did question and answer se uh, sessions. We did teaching sessions for the uh, community and for psychiatry. And it's this idea that uh, Jeremy was talking about, uh, this AMA code, which was born in a, in a pandemic, by the way, right? So this is Percival's ethics born in the Manchester epidemic of typhus, whenever, uh, whatever it was, 17, uh, late 1700s. And it, it tells us that there's a balance between what the organizations can do and what the individual can do. Uh, I mean, you can advocate for patients to be socially distant and to be masked. Um, you can resign, you can uh, go to your you know, state legislature. Uh, there are certain avenues that are acceptable, but ultimately you may have to decide that you can't work in this environment. Uh, and we've seen that. I mean, we saw people uh, leave the uh, med surge uh, hospitals during the height of it um, and go practice else, elsewhere. Uh, so I, I think we, we can use empirical um, ethics and empiricism generally to answer these questions but it has to be couched in terms that we recognize um, because if it is something that's beyond the pale, you know, I'm ready to you know, sue the institution for not being prepared. And this is why Zeke Emanuel and others have said, look, these are the, the, the ways in which we balance the public interest against the, uh, uh, the individual practitioner. Um, you have to consider uh, the protections of the staff along with the protections for, uh, for patients. Uh, and that here's a way to do it. Um, for example, I mean, what, what's your triage uh, process? And, you know, the great commentaries uh, over the last year. Um, so um, do, we, I, I think, do we you know, know if, do we know if we're tracking the questions that come in to the APA, the ethics office or the ethics committee, these kinds of phone calls? Cause I do think that would be a really, interesting other window into the kinds of ethical questions and ethical dilemmas that um, psychiatrists have. It's kind of on the front end. Yeah, well, if I may yeah. jump in. Oh, sorry, Phil, do you want to give a- No, no, no. I don't know if we have a metric. I don't know that we have a metric for that. But what happens is whenever a question comes in, people are referred to an opinion or a uh, particular section of the code or the commentary. And if there's no, um, you know, settled answer, they'll appoint a panel of three members of the ethics committee to come up with a quick answer. Um, so I think we could count those things. Um, I just don't know that there's currently a metric uh, for the phone call. Yeah. Donna, I think that was really what I was referring to as well, that, that um, I don't think we're doing that at the AMA either. It's, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, I don't think we track that. I think that would be another interesting thing to track. And I, I also wanted to respond to Kelsey's question because I, I think what you're saying is what, what, are the, um, what are the limitations of an organization like the APA to sort of look at the overall community and what's its obligation to gather data from the overall community? And I, that's an interesting question. I don't have an answer to it. Yeah, I think it's a similar question for the AMA. I mean, there are organizations and systems, you know, integrated systems of care, hospitals, public health settings that do gather, gather data on what their community thinks about X, Y, and Z. Uh, so maybe that might be in the form of a uh, coalition or 
you know, some group together. But I, th I think it's a question of what, as Phil brought up, you know, what are the limitations of what we can do with the empirical part of it? And, and already, uh, I mean, what, what, what Phil and, and uh, Michelle gathered was great data, but it was a slice of the overall, you know, the overall continuity of what's goes on in the community. So it takes a lot of, a lot of energy to do that. Good to think about that. I think we brought forward a real, a really important range of questions. And honestly, it's a sign of an especially valuable consortium session if we wind up having to stop before we're finished. I have to say, I think this is a fascinating, complex conversation that many people will be continuing to think about with respect to our own organizations. I really wanna thank our outstanding presenters and discussants, Michelle, Phil, Donna, Cherry, you know, you've led us through some principles and good practices in empirical bioethics in an organizational setting. You've pointed out the inherent value ladenness of the process, clarified a number of ways, honestly, when carefully doing this work, as well as transparently sharing the work can really contribute to the evolution of the ethics oriented measures within an organization. I think all organizations are you know, hopefully growing and, uh, you know, responding to changes in uh, their environment, in our social environment, as well as the professional environment. And this has been a, a really helpful forum for exploring how empirical bioethics can be an important piece of that, of that development. I want to also thank our very thoughtful audience. Um, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on the YouTube page of the Harvard Center for Bioethics, also Facebook page. This consortium is going to meet again on January 28th, 2022, and again monthly through the spring as we continue to explore a range of perspectives on issues in organizational ethics. Programs will be announced on our webpage at the Harvard Center of Bioethics, and we look forward to seeing you again. Meanwhile, fourth Fridays, our usual slot, are going to be associated with major holidays and end of year observances for the next couple months. And we hope that everyone enjoys those and returns for a healthy new year to see us next year. Thanks, everybody.